So in these um, circus lunches, we try we try and cover a sort of full spectrum in, in, in terms of our talks, both and, and people on the policy end of things, um, outside of computer science to people who are building systems to the more not not more theoretical end of approaches to dealing with um, uh, privacy and security and other issues related to circus. And uh, we've had less of the latter uh, this this uh, year. Um, but um, today we will get some of it uh, from uh, Guy Rothblum. He's uh, finishing his PhD uh, at MIT um, in the coming few weeks, I believe. Um, we hope. <laughs> with Shafi Goldwasser. Uh, Guy has uh, done a lot of exciting work in his PhD on uh, various uh, aspects of uh, photography, security, and privacy, um, work on uh, uh, Delegating computation, proving the correctness of delegate computation, program checking, memory checking, designing one-time programs, programs you can run only once and, uh, and, and no more. And uh, as well as more recently, um, doing work on privacy, which is what we're doing. Thank you very much uh, for the generous introduction. Um, it's great to be here. So I'll be talking about um, efficient privacy preserving data release. And originally, I was intending to speak about only one work, which was with uh, Cynthia Dwork, Moni Noor, Omer Reingold, and Salil Tatan. Uh, but we've been doing some work, which I think uh, would be interesting, uh, especially for the crowd here. Um, so I hope I'll get a chance to speak about it, time permitting. Um, and that's work with Cynthia Dwork, Moni Noor, Tony Pitassi, and um, Sergei Ekan. So let's get started. Um, the talk today, or the motivation behind the talk today, is doing statistical data analysis. So statistical data analysis comes with tremendous social benefits. We can do things like finding correlations um, between, you know, say, genes and diseases, maybe cure diseases. So analyzing a large collection of statistical data and finding out which gene causes what disease. Provide better services, so from a more computer science point of view, um, improve, get, get improved uh, search engines, improve web search results, or fit ads better to users' queries. Um, we do all sorts of legally mandated uh, statistical data analysis, for example, for running censuses. We do all sorts of fancy data mining, really get a lot of information from large collections of data um, about individuals. So that's really great. You can get a lot out of <coughs> statistical data analysis. Um, but the concern for the talk today is that often when we're doing this analysis, we're doing it about data that contains sensitive information about individuals. So for example, if running a medical study, certainly people's medical records are sensitive information. Even if we're trying to improve our search engine, uh, we're doing it based on users' queries. Um, and people's search queries are very sensitive information. So the data contains <coughs> confidential or sensitive information, but the results of the analysis are made public. Right? If we're publishing our study or if we're putting a better web search engine online, the results are being made public. And the question is, what happens to people's privacy? What happens to the privacy of individuals? Is it compromised? Is it protected? What can we say? So that's the concern for the talk today. Um, and the question is whether actually publishing the results of an analysis on sensitive data in a privacy-preserving way is an achievable goal. What can we do? So the holy grail, what we would like ideally to be able to do, is to get all of the amazing utility of statistical data analysis while protecting the privacy of every individual participant in the data set being analyzed. Right, that would be great. Um, and ideally what we'd want is some sort of privacy preserving automatic procedure um, that allows us to get reasonably accurate answers to very rich, large families of statistical queries. Um, that's what we would want and that's what the talk is going to be about. Um, and just before heading deeper into it, I'm gonna make a little bit of a disclaimer saying that this question of privacy and statistical data analysis is not new. It's been examined as early as the 70s um, in the statistics community. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the previous work that's been done. I'm going to focus on a recent line of work, um, starting with the work of Dean Isim in 2003, that comes at these questions from a more cryptographic point of view. So that's going to be the talk. And in one slide, uh, what I'm going to try to do today is tell you some new good news. So present a new algorithm, a general purpose sanitizer, um, that allows us to answer rich query families, very good accuracy, and useful output format, uh, which I'll talk about later. Um, and this is an algorithm, so being computer scientists, we analyze its running time. The running time depends on the richness of the data being analyzed and the family of queries you want to answer. And it's natural to ask how, you know, how, uh, how good we can make this runtime, or you know, 
how far or down can we take it? And the bad news, which I'll talk about more briefly, um, shows that essentially this algorithm um, for the output format we're talking about has optimal running time or nearly optimal running time. Um, so we're going to have pretty much matching computational hardness results based on cryptographic assumptions. Um, and then to end the talk, uh, hopefully we'll have time, I want to talk a little bit about some of the new challenges we've been thinking about. And in particular, one thing that's been a big concern for us is just this, just this question of is it ever OK to actually have large databases of sensitive information lying around? Is that reasonable, and can it be avoided? Okay, so that'll be at the end. But first, you know, before going into new results, um, what do I mean when I say rich families of queries? What's the notion of utility I'm after? Um, a more interesting question, what do, I, what do I mean when I say privacy? What's the notion of privacy that I'm after? Um, and what was known before? So let's start with that. OK, so first off, utility, because that's easier to pin down. So the model today is going to be that we have, for most of the talk, we have a large database with information about n participants. And every individual participant's information is drawn from some large universe, uh, data universe, large x. Okay, so pictorially, we have this database that has n records. Every record is drawn from a universe x. For example, it could be a database of people's heights. Okay, so it has the heights of n different people. And every height is a value in centimeters between 0 and 300. Now, the kinds of questions we'll want to answer are what we call counting queries. Okay, so we have a set of predicates. And a predicate is just a function labeling every possible item in the data universe with either 0 or 1. And for each of these predicates, we want to answer a query. So every predicate is associated with a query asking how many people satisfy it. Okay? How many people in the database uh, send this predicate to 1. So for example, we could, have a predi we could have the query asking how many people are above 150 centimeters. And that just corresponds to the predicate that labels every height above 150 by 1 and every other height by 0. Okay. So I'm going to intermittently switch between this notion of predicates and queries. Every query is specified by a predicate, and every predicate specifies a query. So you can think of every que queries and predicates as being the same throughout the talk. Um, and one final thing. When I say that we want to answer how many people uh, or how many participants satisfy a predicate, I don't mean that we're after an exact answer. Um, so I'll relax the notion of accuracy uh, throughout the talk. And what I want is to answer, to give the correct answer within some additive error. Okay, so I want to get the correct number of people above 150 centimeters with plus or minus um, some alpha additive error, where alpha is a function of the database size n. And you might object and say that I'm giving a lot on accuracy, but this really is not a huge concern if we're in a statistical data analysis setting, because there's a sampling error that's already inherent in statistical data analysis. It just comes from the fact that you're examining a subset of the entire population and drawing conclusions about it. So having some error is not so bad. The question, of course, is how much error we have. So error close to 0 is very good, and we'll be very happy with it. Error close to n means that we're not getting very meaningful answers. Okay. So the question is where the error lies between this 0 and n. And the magic number uh, to think of through the, throughout the talk is square root of n, because that's the sampling error for large events. We have a data analysis. So if we're very close to square root of n, we're sort of happy. Certainly if we're below square root of n, we're happy. If we're above it, we're paying something um, for privacy. Maybe that's still OK. So that's the utility notion. Um, in terms of the model, um, there are actually two models, in the, especially in the privacy-preserving data analysis literature. Um, the main model that's been considered is actually the interactive model. So in this model, we have a database of sensitive information. We have our sanitizer who sort of owns the database and is trusted and look at it. And then users come along, and a user comes along. He asks the sanitizer a question. The sanitizer goes to the database, computes a privacy-preserving answer, gives it back to the user. The user now adaptively chooses a second question, asks the sanitizer, the second uh, privacy-preserving answer. And this goes on and on. The total number of queries that can be asked is usually bounded. In order, you know, there's a global bound of, on the number of questions the sanitizer will answer um, just to avoid privacy breaches. So there's a global bound uh, about the number of questions. And also, as long as the users can come along and ask questions, the sanitizer sort of has to maintain this database and stay around um, to answer the user's questions. So that's a main model that has been considered, or one of the main models that's been considered. I won't talk about it at all today. The main model I want to consider in the talk is the non-interactive model. So in this model, the queries are specified non-adaptively and in advance. So the sanitizer is given some potentially huge set of queries <coughs> in advance, uh, implicitly or explicitly specified. 
it could just be a list of queries or there could be some, short, some shorter representation. And now given this uh, set of queries, the sanitizer goes to the database and just in one shot computes some privacy preserving answer block, some privacy preserving information that contains the answer to all the queries. And we call this blob the sanitization. So this is done in one shot that's based on this entire set of queries. And once it's done, the database and the sanitizer can sort of go away. There's no need anymore. All the answers are contained in this privacy preserving blob. And when a user wants to compute an answer to any one of the queries, he can just go to the blob on his own to compute the answer. Okay. So that's a non-interactive model which I'll be considering today. <coughs> if you think of publishing a study, this is usually what happens. You take, I mean, you have your set of questions, you publish the answer, and hopefully you delete the database that you used. Okay, so that's the model. We know what our notion of futility is. What's the privacy guarantee that I'm after? So especially if we're thinking as cryptographers, um, ideally what we'd want is something close to the notion of semantic security um, of Goldwasser and Mikali for encryption. So ideally we'd want to say that anything that could be learned about an individual from the sanitized data could also be learned without it. That would be great for privacy. We could give such a guarantee. And in fact, it was sort of suggested as a benchmark by Delinius back in 1977. So for privacy, it's great. The question is, what sort of utility can you get with this kind of strong privacy guarantee? And unfortunately, you can't really get much. And this was shown by Dwork and Orr. They actually showed that you can't get any meaningful notion of utility while satisfying the strong notion of privacy. And essentially, the problem turns out to be um, auxiliary input or auxiliary information, by which I mean a priori information that an adversary might have about people in the database. So an adversary might know some, some information about me, not all of my information, before you know, even seeing the results of the analysis. And this can become a big problem. Okay, so Dworkin or showed it can be a big problem from a theory point of view, but also in practice it turns out to be a big issue. And let me just give one example uh, that I cannot resist going into. So the example is a Netflix challenge. Um, so Netflix is a movie rental website. One of their pride and joys is the movie recommendation system uh, that keeps suggests movies to users and hopefully keeps users renting movies and keeps Netflix um, and keeps them paying Netflix money. So Netflix really wants to improve the movie recommendation uh, system. And one way they do this is by uh, the Netflix challenge. So they want to post some data, some data set about users' data, what movies users like and what recommendations they like. And they want machine learning people throughout the world to work on this database, this data set, and give them a better movie recommendation system. There's a million dollars grant prize can improve the performance of the recommendation <laughs> system. Um, now, of course, Netflix doesn't really want to publish the real data set of uh, what movies <laughs> users are renting. You, the users wouldn't be very happy with that, right? We wouldn't want our movie rentals exposed to the public. So what they do is they sanitize or anonymize um, their database. And they do this simply by removing user names. Okay? So instead of saying, Guy Rothblum rented this and that movie at this and that time, it would say user number 9762 rented this and that movie at this and that time. Hopefully, no one knows that I'm user number, whatever number I said, um, and so my privacy is preserved. Okay, that's the hope uh, that they had when they actually sanitized their database and published it. Unfortunately, things are not so simple, and this was shown by Narayan and Shmanikov, who attacked the Netflix um, anonymization procedure, and they did it using auxiliary information. They used the Internet Movie Database, which is just a movie recommendation website. Users can log on, and they can post reviews under their own name if they want for movies that they're proud that they saw. But by correlating the dates and times of movie rentals from Netflix and movie recommendations on IMDb, Narayan and Shmatikov showed that it was very quickly or very easily possible to pin down, to actually identify individual users. Um, and once a user is identified, all the movies the user rented from Netflix are exposed, not only the ones that the user is sort of proud to have seen. Okay, so in fact, this was actually later used to expose some sensitive information about individual, individuals' movie rentals. Um, so the problem here really was that when Netflix was sanitizing its database, they didn't have in mind this auxiliary information. They didn't think about the Internet Movie Database or what kind of side channel information um, an attacker might have about their users. So when we're thinking about privacy, we have to think about auxiliary input or auxiliary information. Um, and we want to formalize some sort of guarantee, a strong guarantee. And such a guarantee was suggested by Gorg McSherry, Nisim, and Smith in 2006. It's called differential privacy. Where again, as throughout the talk, the idea is to protect individual participants. 
So the flavor of the guarantee, the flavor of differential privacy, is to say that the probability of any bad event that can happen to an individual user only increases by a small multiplicative factor when that user is inside the database as opposed to the probability when the user is not even present in the database. Okay? So the hope, at least, is that when the user is not in the database, bad things can't happen, so they're unlikely to happen even when the user enters the database. One safe thing to say is that this is a guarantee that is really geared towards encourage, encouraging people to participate in data analyses because you're not going to be hurt by your participation in the data analysis. Okay? That on its own is not going to hurt you. That's the guarantee given by differential types. So a little more formally, what do I mean uh, when I say the probability of events only increases by a small multiplicative factor? Uh, we say that a sanitizing mechanism is epsilon differentially private. If for any other values, for any database, or for any values of the other users in the database, and for any event, think of this as a bad event that can happen, for any event that can happen, the probability that the event happens when I'm in the database, that's in the denominator, divided by its probability <coughs> when I'm not in the database, the denominator, the ratio between these is between 1 plus epsilon and 1 minus epsilon. So bad events sort of increase by a 1 plus epsilon uh, multiplicative. The probability of bad events increases only by a 1 plus epsilon multiplicative factor when I enter the database. And I said we had to think about auxiliary inf information when we were thinking about privacy. And this definition, or this guarantee, actually handles auxiliary information. And essentially, you can think of any kind of bad auxiliary information that an attacker might have as being plugged into the event. Since it's a sort of where we're quantifying over any possible bad event that can happen, auxiliary information technically goes into the bad event and is handled. Is it important that it's two-sided? I mean, could you do better if it was just one-sided? Um, if you're talking about bad events, it's not clear to me why Yeah, I mean, so I don't know, I don't want to make a judgment about what kind of event is, um, is good or bad. So I would have, you know, if I have a bad event that is happening with slightly higher probability, maybe a good event is happening with smaller probability. I just want to bound all events. So, yeah. Um, good. So throughout the talk, I won't be making this, um, I won't be making as strong, I, may, I won't be making this strong, um, I won't be achieving this strong guarantee, I'll make a slight relaxation. And the relaxation I want to make has to do with the fact that I just told you that we are considering all bad events, but in fact I'm not really concerned about any event uh, in the world. The, the events I'm concerned about are events that can actually happen. So if an event has exponentially small, sort of very, very tiny probability, whether a user is inside the database or outside of the database, I don't really care about the ratio between these exponentially small probabilities because neither one of the events is ever really going to happen. <coughs> so all I care about are events with noticeable probability, so events that can really happen uh, when the user is inside or outside of the database. And formally, um, we capture this by, or this is captured by epsilon negligible, what's known as epsilon negligible differential privacy. And we just allow a negligible quantity to be added or subtracted from the nominator and the denominator for these inequalities to hold. Um, okay, and one last note about, uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about the definition, but one last note, at least for the cryptographers in the audience, um, as opposed to what maybe we're used to um, here when I talk about epsilon differential privacy, epsilon is not a negligible quantity in the database size. Think of epsilon throughout the talk as being a small constant. Okay, so epsilon is 1 over 10 or 1 over 100, um, and the probability of bad events increases by, say, 1.01 .01 multiplicative factor. Okay. So just to get um, some flavor, uh, some idea of the flavor of the guarantee, let's quickly go, go through two examples showing how to get differential privacy and how not to get differential privacy. So in both examples, um, I want to have a database that has collec a collection of users. For every user, it stores the, the name of the user together with a tag. The tag is either 0 or 1, indicating something about the user. And I just want to answer one query. I want to say, what, I want to say how many of the participants uh, in the database have tag equal to 1. So here's a bad way of doing this for privacy. One way we could do this is just to choose and release a random, a random subset of the tags of users. I choose a random subset of the users, and I release their tags. This is actually great for accuracy. This will give you very quickly a very good approximation about the number of participants with tag equal 1 versus tag equal 0. So for accuracy, it's very good. For privacy, it's very bad. Um, so Technically, um, let's consider the following bad events. Say we're all in the database. 
Everyone's tag is 1 except mine. And you all know that you all have tag equal to 1. The only question is whether my tag is 1 or 0. Okay? This you don't know, and this I would like to keep secret, sensitive information. Say my tag is 0. Okay? So and now we run the sanitizer. A random subset of the people, of people is chosen, and their tags released. The question is, if I'm in the database, and I'm one of the people chosen, then, some, then you all know that someone has tag equal 0, and you all know that it has to be me, because you all have tag equal to 1. So the bad, this bad event happens when I'm in the database with probability at least 1 over n. You know, people are chosen at random with probability 1 over n. I'm going to be chosen at least. If I'm not in the database, no one has tag equal 0. So a 0 tag is never released, and the, this bad event has probability 0. Okay, so here, the ratio between the probabilities of these events is infinite. This is not uh, private for any epsilon. It's not epsilon private for any epsilon. And really, this idea of choosing and releasing um, information about a random subset of the people intuitively also is bad for privacy, because someone's privacy is always hurt. It's true that for any one person, uh, the probability that their information is released is small, but someone is always hurt, and so we're not happy with that solution. So what would we be happy with? Here's a different idea that has been very successful. Let's, let, let's just compute the number of tags, of number of people with tag equal 1 in the data set and add some noise to that before releasing it. Okay, so we release the correct number of ones plus some noise. And this, if we choose the noise carefully, can be shown to be differentially private. Basically what we want is a noise, a noise distribution where the probability of noise values, say k minus 1, is only slightly smaller than the probability of noise value, is only slightly different than the no probability of noise value k. Okay. So basically, we want the noise to come from a bell curve because we want the probability of large noise to be small for accuracy. But we don't want the bell to be too steep for privacy. Um, and setting the parameters appropriately, you can actually draw the noise from a Laplace or a binomial or a Gaussian distribution. Um, these work, and they actually can be shown to, give, to satisfy the strong definition of uh, epsilon differential privacy. OK, so, so much for what we want in terms of privacy, and we know what we want in terms of utility. Um, let's briefly go over what was known by previous work. So unfortunately, uh, early works showed that utility and privacy don't always go hand in hand. They can't always be achieved simultaneously. And we have negative results, uh, specifically for counting queries, um, where for a database with n participants, we have a specific collection of n counting queries about n counting queries that cannot be answered with less than square root of n error. Okay, the original result is from the Nurenissim and extensions in later work. <coughs> So you can't answer too many queries with too little noise. And by can't answer, I don't just mean that you wouldn't be able to get the strong notion of differential privacy, but you really wouldn't be able to get any reasonable notion of privacy. Um, so if you answer this number of queries with less than square root of n um, error, with less than square root of n noise, almost the entire input database is compromised. Okay, so really, no meaningful notion of privacy can be achieved. So those are impossibility results. We have to live with them. The question is, what can we do? Okay. Um, so possibility results and possibility results, we can either answer less queries than this, or we can add more noise. Okay. And that's what previous work has done. Most previous work has focused on the first direction, so answering less queries. Um, and if the number of queries we want to answer is smaller than the, da the database size, then we can do quite a lot. And the main technique is, that's used is, as I said before in the example for how to sanitize, just to add independent noise to the answers on every query. So you compute independent noise values for the answers on every query, and you can show that this gives you privacy. So Dinurinissim and Dworkinissim show that you can actually answer an almost linear um, number of queries with less than square root of n error uh, while getting uh, epsilon differential privacy, so constant epsilon, so almost matching the negative results, okay. nearly tight. And when we look at these results, um, first off, what I want us to notice is that the accuracy is great. We're below the square root of n magic number uh, where the sanitizer error is less than the sampling error uh, that we expect anyway in statistical data analysis. So that's very good. Um, of course, what's bad is the richness of the analysis we can run. We can only answer a few queries. Um, this may be OK if we're talking about a huge database. For example, our database is the Google search logs. It's information, it's about, information about hundreds of millions of users. Still, I'm not sure that Google wouldn't want to run um, an automatic procedure that's asking a lot of questions about its search logs. And certainly, if you want to run a medical study with you know, a few hundred or a few thousand participants, this is a serious, uh, this is a serious problem. 
Uh, you can only answer, ask a few questions. So what about asking more queries in the database size? Um, the possibility results say we can't have less than square root of n error. Um, <coughs> but that's a, maybe that's OK. I mean, square root of n error is still pretty small. <coughs> So the question is whether we can get something around square root of an error or any non-trivial results when the number of queries is large. Um, until very recently, uh, there were actually no positive results for general classes of counting queries. Um, and it was a question whether you can even hope to do a rich analysis, a rich uh, data analysis in a small database while preserving the privacy of individuals. Um, and the first such result was given actually in a recent breakthrough last year. Um, this is a result of uh, Blum, Liggett, and Roth. And they show that, in fact, you can get um, rich data analysis, answer many more queries than the database size. Uh, they show that you can answer any set of queries with error that's something like n to the 2 thirds, so database size of the 2 thirds, times log the size of the query set uh, that you're trying to answer. Okay, so yeah, it's a remarkable result both quantitatively, so even if the number of queries you're trying to answer is very large, you know, sub-exponential in the database size, your error is still pretty small, so definitely sublinear, non-trivial error. Um, and it's also a remarkable result in a qualitative sense uh, in terms of the output of their sanitizer. Uh, so the output of their sanitizer is what we call a synthetic database. It's a database in its own right, uh, which is a very useful property. So let me spend a little more time talking about that. I said before that for non-interactive mechanisms, the sanitizer outputs some blob containing the answers of the queries. And I didn't say anything about what the format of this blob could be. Um, if we're talking about a sanitizer that's outputting a synthetic database, then this blob isn't just a list of answers of the queries, but in fact it's going to be a database in its own right, just a collection of records from the same data universe as the input database. Of course, it's not the same as the input database because it has to be privacy preserving, but it has the same format. Okay, and the property of this synthetic database is that for any one of the queries in this pre-specified set, for any one of their predicates, the fraction of people satisfying the predicate in the output synthetic database is about the same as the fraction of people satisfying um, the predicate in the input database. Okay. So the user is, this is a sort of very small and implicit representation of the answers to potentially a very large set of queries. Um, and users on their own can just, given a query, given a predicate, compute the answer from the synthetic database. Um, just compute the fraction of people satisfying the predicate. So why do I say this is uh, nice? I mean, it's sort of aesthetically appealing in that it's, a con it's sort of a nice representation for a lot of information. Um, but also, so statisticians really like this. First off, it's compatible um, with all of their existing software because now they can just run their software to do an analysis on a database, the fact that the database synthetic and privacy preserving doesn't really matter. Um, and also, so th this guarantees consistency, which is another thing that statisticians really like. So for example, it's guaranteed here that if I ask how many people in this output database are above 150 centimeters, and then I ask how many people are above 151 centimeters, the answer to the second question isn't going to be bigger than the first. If, I, if we were just answering queries by adding independent noise, noise could be added in a weird way that would make the answer to the number of people above 151 larger than the number of people above 100. So consistency is also important. And here we get it automatically. OK, so sort of a breakthrough result in terms of what we think we can accomplish, but there is a catch. And the catch is the running time of the algorithm. So it does answer large collections of queries with non-trivial error. But the problem is that it has very large running time um, as a function of the data universe size and a function of the query set size. So super polynomial running time, running time grows like some, something like the data universe size to the power um, essentially of n over the error you're trying to achieve. So if you're trying to go for uh, sublinear, say for error n to the 2 thirds, this is size of the data universe to some polynomial in the database size to the power log the query set size. So very large running time. Um, and the running time isn't just a problem in the analysis. It's not like, say, linear programming where we just don't know how to analyze the running time. But this really sort of, in any way we know of for implementing this algorithm, this really will be the running time. And the reason is that it uses the exponential mechanism, um, a technique of McSherry and Talwar for getting privacy preserving algorithms that essentially has to do with enumerating every possible output of the mechanism and generating a distribution on these, all the possible outputs by brute force. Um, so it always comes with this heavy running time uh, cost. 
So the take home point uh, from the blum legged Roth result, I think, is first off that we can maybe do things we didn't think we could do before, uh, but we still can't do them in practice. Okay? So we still don't have an implementable uh, mechanism for answering many queries on a small database. Um, and that will be the main focus of uh, the new results I will talk about today. Um, and the question we want to ask is, can we efficiently sanitize? Can we get an algorithm that we can actually implement? Um, and what I want us to consider is the running time of our algorithm, of our sanitizer, as a function of the query set size and a function of the data universe. Okay, so we saw the blum roth uh, algorithm had super polynomial, super polynomial running time in both of these. Um, and now I want to ask what we can achieve for sanitizers with a synthetic database out there. So the main thing I want to talk about, uh, good news, is that we can actually get a polynomial time um, algorithm, an algorithm that runs in polynomial time, in, uh, the data universe size and the query set. Um, unfortunately, in this setting, if the data universe and the query set are implicitly specified, specified so a small implicit representation, we could hope even for sub-polynomial running time. I mean, unfortunately, what we'll see is that if you want a synthetic database output, at least, um, your running time cannot be subpolynomial um, in either the data universe size or the period size. Anyway, I won't talk about it much today, but, um, but we do show that it cannot be done. Okay, so let's talk a little. Let's talk a little bit about the algorithm, about this good news. So, Lumlegged Roth showed that you can sanitize any set of queries. Error was something like n to the 2 thirds. Running time was large. So that's the old result. The new result that we will show is how to sanitize any set of queries where, your error, where the error is something like square root of n, square root of the database size, times some factor that's smaller than any polynomial um, in the query set size. Okay, so for example, if you think of the query set size as being polynomial in the database size, this second term becomes very, very small. Moreover, the running time of the new algorithm is just polynomial. It's polynomial in the database size, data universe size, and query set sizes. Um, so this does give us what we wanted, which is an implementable or efficient general purpose sanitizer uh, for answering large collections of queries um, on a small database. Um, now comparing it with the blum roth result, in terms of the error, our, our initial error factor, n to the half is better than n to the 2 thirds, they have a better dependency on the query set size, and it's an interesting question uh, to try to minimize, uh, to try to lower our dependence on the query set size to also be polylogarithmic. Okay. Um, the one thing I want to say is that comparing this with the negative results, um, we're getting very close. So, for example, if you want to answer, say, a huge number of queries, n to the 100, um, your error asymptotically will behave something like n to the half plus little o of 1. So very close to the square root of n, and we know you can't do better than square root of n, even if you only want to answer n queries. So we're getting pretty close. What can't, what we know we can't be done. Okay, so that's the good news. I wanna briefly tell you a few ideas from the algorithm, um, and then a little bit about negative results and future work. So algorithm is recursive. Uh, we have a database D and a big query set uh, that we want to answer. Now say recursively we have a small sanitizer, by which I mean we have a sanitizer A prime that works for smaller query sets, for subsets C prime, for any subset C prime of the query set C, okay, for a small subset of the, large, of the larger query set. And say furthermore that this A prime that we have recursively outputs um, a small synthetic database. That's its output format. So this somehow we get by recursion. And now I, let's try to build up from that. So we have our big query set C. We have the small sanitizer A prime. What we'll do is just sample uh, at random a subset of the queries in C. So we're sampling some subset C prime of the queries, small subset. We'll take it aside and we'll use A prime to sanitize it. Okay, so out comes some synthetic, we use A prime, out comes some small synthetic database that gives accurate answers um, to all the queries in C prime. Okay. That's still not. It seems like it's not getting us very far because C prime is just a small, a small collection of queries. We want to get accurate answers to all the queries in C. But what we'll see, sort of by magic, it's not magic, it's a simple argument. Um, this small synthetic database that we get from A prime, actually with high probability, gives good answers on almost all of the queries in C. Okay? So not only on this small collection, but on almost all of the queries. So, so there's some bad set, B, small, bad or underprivileged queries on which the synthetic database we got doesn't give accurate answers. 
But, on ev but everywhere else, on all the other queries, we are actually getting for free, <coughs> essentially, um, accurate answers. So we're closer to where we want to be. Still, we have this annoying set of queries uh, that are bad or underprivileged and we don't have accurate answers for. Uh, but we can take care of them sort of, this is actually the most technically involved point, but we can sort of take them aside um, and fix them or give good answer, get good answers for them manually. Um, and in the end, so we take them aside, we fix them manually, and in the end we have accurate answers to all the queries um, that we, we want to. So that's uh, essentially what the algorithm does. Of course, I need to tell you where we get this um, small sanitizer A prime. I said by recursion, so I mean, we can keep the recursion going, but in the end we're going to have, we're going to hit the bottom of the recursion. We're going to have some sm small set of queries. I'm not telling you how we get um, a small synthetic database that gives um, good answers even for a small set of queries. So I need to tell you where we get that from. Um, why this sort of magic happens, uh, I haven't told you. And of course, again, the, actually the, the involved point is how to fix these underprivileged uh, queries. Um, that, that has some challenges in it. So in the talk today, um, I figured I wouldn't go into the first and the third points, which are more technical. And I focus on just trying to tell you why this magic happens. Um, so let's try to do that. Um, so what we can actually show is that if you have a sanitizer for a small query set that outputs um, a small synthetic database, you can actually get a sanitizer for almost the entire large query set. A little more formally, we have a big query set C and a small sanitizer A prime that works for subsets of C, subset C prime of, say, size S, and outputs a small synthetic database say of length m bits, um, we can actually show that its output um, gives good answers for almost all the queries in C with high probability. Um, so <coughs> you get utility on all but a small fraction of the queries, all but an m over s, um, essentially, fraction of the queries. So the, the more queries or the bigger the sets of queries that A prime works for and the smaller its output, the better the utility you get. Okay, so let's see why this happens. Remember, we have our large query set C. And what I want <coughs> to do now is to consider some m-bit uh, synthetic database output of A prime. Okay, so some m-bit database that A prime could output. Let's call it Y. And let's consider this synthetic database Y versus the original database that we had D. Okay? And let's just go over the queries in this large query set C. And for each of them, either Y gives a close answer, the fraction of people in Y who satisfy that predicate is close to the fraction in D, or it's far away from the fraction in D. So we have this Y, it's potential output. We're comparing it with the real database. And you know, every potential output is going to be good for some queries and bad for others. So let's think about a Y that has a large set of bad queries, a large set of queries that it gives inaccurate answers for. Okay, so a set of fractional size, something like M over S. And here we have this uh, large set of bad queries um, for this specific Y. What I claim now is that when we sample C prime, the set of queries that we're sampling at random, with high probability we'll intersect, we'll land inside this bad set at some point. Okay? So when we're sampling C prime at random, we will have intersection with Y. <coughs> and this is just a simple sampling argument or a birthday paradox. Um, if you have a large set and you're sampling at, a large subset and you're sampling at random, at some point you're going to land inside the large subset. Okay? In fact, you'll land inside the subset with all but exponentially small probability in M. Okay, so the probability you have no intersection is tiny. And it's so tiny that we can, in fact, union bound over all the potential m-bit output databases. And we get that with high probability, when we're choosing the C prime, with high probability over the choice of C prime, for every single Y, for every single uh, m-bit database that has a large bad set, uh, the C prime intersect its, intersects its bad set. Okay. So, <coughs> This is just a you know, simple sampling argument in a union bound. And let's see what it actually tells us. So we know when we're running, we have, remember, our small sanitizer A prime. We're running it on the database. And we're getting some small synthetic database that's good for all of the queries in C prime. Okay, this is the guarantee that the, we got from the small sanitizer. This we know on one hand. On the other hand, we know that every synthetic database um, that has a large set of bad queries it's also bad for some query in C prime. Okay, it's set of bad queries intersect C prime. So this means that the Y star that we got cannot have a large set of bad queries. 
If it had a large set of bad queries, it would be bad for some query in C prime. We know that's not the case. So in fact, uh, it can only have a small set of bad queries. Pictorially, it looks something like this. Um, yeah, so I guess the, the principle we're using here um, can be thought of as uh, Occam's razor, which is a scientific principle. It's used in learning theory. And essentially, it says that um, simple explanations tend to generalize well. And to some extent, that's what we're seeing here. We have this simple explanation, small synthetic database, um, that gives us good answers uh, for the queries in C prime. And we're seeing that, in fact, it will generalize well when we're considering all the queries in C. It will give us good answers for almost all of them. OK. So briefly, um, for the bad news, um, we think about this task of sanitizing, both with general output and with synthetic database output. Um, we show negative results. For general output, we show a tight connection between trader tracing schemes and cryptography and the hardness of sanitizing. I'll talk about it a little more on the next slide. For sanitizing uh, with synthetic database outputs, um, using standard cryptographic assumptions, we show that the running time cannot be subpolynomial um, in either the data universe size or the query set size. Um, and the second point actually takes us back, taking us back to the um, exponential mechanism, this general tool that uh, Blum, Ligon, and Roth were using. Uh, it actually shows us that the exponential mechanism cannot, in general, be implemented efficiently. So it has consequences for all of the results uh, that are using the exponential mechanism. Um, and the way we show all of these uh, negative results is, again, using cryptographic as hardness assumptions. So using standard cryptographic assumptions, uh, we show that data sanitizing tasks are hard. So for sanitizing with general output, um, what we show is an equivalence between trader tracing, which is a method for content protection and cryptography, um, and the hardness of sanitization. And we don't only show an existential equivalence, but there's actually a tight connection uh, in the parameters between the data universe um, and query set sizes that are hard to sanitize, and the key and ciphertext sizes um, in trader tracing schemes. And in particular, um, using known constructions of trader tracing schemes under more or less standard cryptographic <coughs> assumptions, uh, we actually get separations between what you can do efficiently and in exponential time uh, in terms of sanitizing. This uses um, a trader tracing scheme of Vanessa High and Waters. Um, and I want to say, we have this tight equivalence. And now, a very interesting open question, where in the realm of parameters is trader tracing possible? Um, and where in the realm of, param of parameters is sanitizing possible? We know they can sort of coexist, uh, but the question is where does one become possible and the other impossible? And we're not really sure where that boundary lies. Um, in particular, this is connected to the question of whether the key and ciphertext sizes in trader tracing schemes um, can be independent of the number of users. Okay, so that's for general output. Uh, for sanitizing with a synthetic database output, um, as I said before, we can show that the running time can't be subpolynomial in data universe or query set size. Um, this is done using standard cryptographic assumptions, so digital signatures um, and pseudorandom functions. Um, and to sum up, at least this, um, for telling you a little bit about future work, um, some of this part of the talk, what we saw is that on one hand, efficient general purpose sanitizing is possible if you're willing to run in time polynomial as data universe and query number size. Uh, but there are limits to what can be done. And we have more or less matching um, hardness results for the synthetic database output case and also hardness results for the general output case. And as a theme through the talk, um, both in the positive and the negative results, um, we saw that whether or not your output is a synthetic database uh, can make a big difference. So it's both useful for positive results um, and leads to stronger negative results. And also, what wasn't a priori clear, computational efficiency um, is important, and there's a tight connection to cryptography. And what you can do in polynomial time and in non-polynomial time are two very different things. OK, so very briefly, um, I want to end uh, with a new challenge that we've been thinking about. Um, and the challenge we've been thinking about is, you know, there's a social privacy maxim that says that if you're using data, you should only be using it for the purpose for which it was collected. Okay. 
And really the question that we want to ask is, who's watching the curator of the data, or who's watching the sanitizer? And do we really trust any entity to safeguard these databases of sensitive information? So if you're thinking about Google and their search, their search query log, you know, these big databases are subject to a lot of threats. Um, and they have a lot of sensitive information. So subject to mission creep, you know, people have big databases of valuable information. They keep wanting to extract more and more utility out of them, or more and more money out of them. Um, without maybe the proper concern for privacy. But even if the curator is you know, innocent and really wants to pre preserve people's privacy, still subject to security breaches, uh, to subpoenas. We've seen you know, companies very unwillingly being forced to release uh, their sensitive databases. <coughs> um, a recent example, so there's this um, baseball <laughs> drug, te drug testing uh, scandal or controversy where anonymous drug tests, so there were anonymous drug tests run with a guarantee of anonymity, but the results were sort of held up, were stored by the company, by a co the company that was running the drug test. They were later seized because of an independent federal investigation, and the results of the supposedly anonymous drug tests were leaked. People's uh, privacy was, comp was violated. It was steroid users in particular were identified. Um, so the question we want to ask today is, can we get um, algorithms that are private sort of from the inside, inside and out um, algorithms that are private even in terms of their internal state. So even if the internal state is revealed, privacy is maintained. Uh, and the goal is to allow a curator to accumulate the statistical information, but without being subject to the subpoenas, without being subject to security breaches, without ever storing sensitive data um, about individuals. So some of the, um, the model we want to consider is, we always have web search in mind, uh, search queries in mind, and the model is, a stream of data items coming in, um, one after another, and the curator gets to see each item, updates to, update its internal state, and then sort of the item disappears. And the hope is that the curator doesn't just store <laughs> these items uh, in its memory, but it only stores some privacy-preserving information. So the way it looks, we have this sort of data. This is the data stream from left to right. We have uh, different users with different colors, items about different users in different colors. And we have this curator who's getting the items one by one. He has some state, sees the first item, updates his state, and then the item is discarded and deleted. <coughs> Second item comes along, updates the state, the item is deleted. And the idea is when we're talking about pan privacy, um, is that even if now the internal state is sort of breached and becomes observable to the outside world, the, the privacy of users that have come in so far is not violated. Okay? So at any single point in time, the internal state itself is differentially private. Okay, so even if there's an intrusion, uh, privacy is maintained. Okay, so this goes on, you know, the state is updated and the information is deleted. The whole uh, data stream is processed. At the end, hopefully we have some very meaningful statistics about the data stream without ever having to store <coughs> sensitive information. Okay. Mm -hmm. so question. Is it colors for the users? Yeah, sorry. So four yellow data items there. When you say differentially private, do you mean if I take away those four items? Um, yeah. Yeah, very good question. So there's a distinction between what we call user level and event level privacy, which, right. has, which has to do with whether you're trying to protect the privacy of an individual data item or of all the items pertaining to a single user. And we're talking about protecting all the items pertaining to a single user. If we're talking about web search, the guarantee is that um, whether or not you made all of your queries together, you know, however many queries you made, um, your privacy is preserved. Um, good, that's a good question. Thanks. Um, okay, and I'll just note that since we aim for these sort of collections of streaming data, where the you should think of the amount of data is huge, um, a second objective, privacy aside, is also to have very small internal state and very quick uh, update time. Okay, so. The internal state should be, say, polylogarithmic in the data stream size. Um, so I won't, I wanted to say a few words, but I'll try to end on time. So I won't go into much detail. I wanted to give you as an example um, how we actually estimate um, the stream density or the number of distinct elements in the stream, which is sort of a classic uh, problem in the streaming literature. Um, I can talk about it a little more after the end of the talk if people are interested. Um, so let me quickly go through these two slides. Um, and just tell you a little bit about what we can do uh, in this, pa in this pan uh, private setting. So as I said, we can estimate the number of distinct elements or the stream density. We can do statistics like uh, croft means. 
uh, which is just the mean over all the users of the number of, of the minimum between the number of appearances of the user and some cropping value t. Uh, we can estimate the fraction of items appearing exactly k times or the fraction of items appearing at least k times. Um, and the way I was talking about it before, we were only trying to handle one intrusion. So at one point in time, there's an intrusion um, and privacy is maintained. We can also handle a bounded number of intrusions. So we have some extensions for that. Um, to sum up, uh, there's, I think there's a lot of interesting research happening right now and a lot of progress in our understanding of what we can and cannot do in terms of maintaining privacy and getting rich statistics. Um, there are also sort of an infinite number of uh, open questions, um, just a few of them to think about now. Um, so I presented this notion of differential privacy. Um, sort of, it's become, it's been used a lot. Um, we like it, we know how to achieve it. Um, on the other hand, we're not really sure what is and is not captured by differential privacy. And there are other notions of privacy to consider. Um, so really, the question of what the right notion is and what exactly the guarantee we're, we're getting is, is still, to some extent, open. Um, what the right, is there one right notion and what it is? Um, it's an open question. Um, one thing I don't want you to leave the talk as, is the talk one state I don't want you to leave the talk in is discouraged by negative results. So it's true that we have these computational hardness results. But one thing to bear in mind is that they're only for general purpose sanitizing. And the actual classes, the actual query sets that we show are hard to sanitize are not natural in any sense. Okay? They're using cryptography. They're doing things like verifying signatures or computing pseudorandom functions. Definitely not the kinds of things that you would actually want to do if you're doing a statistical data analysis in practice or in reality. So. It still remains entirely possible that for any or for almost any uh, class, even exponentially large class of queries we would want to ask to answer in practice, sanitizing is possible very efficiently. Um, and this is similar to the situation in the computational learning theory uh, community where they have strong negative results for general purpose learning. It hasn't stopped them from being very successful in learning specific concept classes. <coughs> yeah, and I only briefly got to talk about who watches the curator and this sort of uh, pan privacy concern. Uh, there's a wide spectrum of open questions, um, and we have some preliminary results about them. Um, so that's another interesting direction um, on future research. Um, and I think more generally, when we talk about privacy, it really comes up in any setting where we have, where we have a computational procedure or you know, any procedure that's taking as input sensitive information and has it as, as output some public outcome. Um, privacy becomes a concern, and you, know, you can think of many different settings in which this happens, you know, social networks, Online data that's coming in in an unpredictable manner. Um, learning theory, you know, what kinds of data sets are we learning and what can we say about privacy? Um, and really, almost you know, any algorithm that's being run on sensitive information, what happens to privacy and what's the trade off between privacy and utility that you can get? Uh, so, a lot of questions to be asked and answered. That's it. Thank you. I mean, so in terms of positive results, um, one positive result that's already known is sort of for geometric kinds of questions. So the negative results are very sort of specific to specific class of questions that cannot be sanitized. And these specific questions are, you know, verify the digital signature, this and that digital signature, output this and that bit of the verification. Um, for example, questions that people really want to ask often have to do with things like, um, so geometric queries about half spaces, sort of you have some set of points in d-dimensional space and you want to put half spaces or planes and ask how many people are above and below your plane. <coughs> um, and that, for that we have some, they're not exactly positive results in terms of the utility that I was, I mean, they don't exactly get the notion of utility I was talking about today. They get a relaxed notion of utility, but they can answer an exponential family of questions and they have very efficiently and with a very small implicit uh, representation of that answer. So definitely for geometric queries, which is also part of the stuff that people have been doing, doing in learning theory. Uh, 
Um, in learning theory, so I mean, one direction you might want to follow in learning theory is looking at low complexity classes, uh, which is what people have done in learning theory. Um, there isn't as much hope for that here. Um, so our negative results are, or the, the, the queries that you cannot sanitize are in lower complexity classes than what's known to be hard for learning theory. Um, so that's maybe not as promising a direction. And I guess it's also, I guess, maybe we don't, we assume more specific types of information Data more specific range of data. Data. Right. Possibly. I mean, it would also that would also be limiting the sort of the family of queries you can ask. And then,